What's up, Kansas City? I'm your host, Glenn Brian Frizzell. Today we are taping Negro Leagues Baseball Museum, 18th and Vine Street. Joining me today is Ms. Kimba Smith, who has written a book, The Poster Child. It's her story of survival. She has used her experience to speak motivationally to others, as well as to inspire her through her story. How are you doing here today? I am great, and I'm so happy to be on What's Up, Kansas City, and I appreciate you taking the time out to do this interview. We're happy that you could be here with us today. Can you talk, tell us a little bit about who brought you here? And um, um, An organization called National Alliance of Faith and Justice, they are sponsoring uh, this What's Love Got to Do With It launch that has been launched in four different cities across the country, um, Prince George County, D.C., uh, Fort Walton, Florida, and uh, Norwalk, Connecticut. And so this is our final stop with the launch, but ultimately it's a curriculum that's geared around my story, Poster Child. Uh, the curriculum's called What's Love Got to Do With It? And basically it is um, encouraging young people to make healthy choices and to look at various aspects of what goes on in our communities and what goes on in our legal system. Um, and making you know healthy choices and also developing their goals and aspirations as far as where they're going to go in life and hopefully this curriculum can help guide them in not getting in those toxic relationships or roads to self-destruction. Now I read a little bit about your story and I know this is up on Amazon. Can you tell me why when I looked up uh, the price list it was $94. Can people get it a little that's expensive if they well, come see, through you. That's someone that probably has their own copy that's trying to sell it for ninety four dollars. But mm -hmm. um, I'm self I'm a self published author, so the only place where you can um, get my book, unless I'm speaking in your city, um, doing a talk and selling it, is off my website, which is kimbasmith.com, k e m b a s m i t h dot com. And basically, um, it took me a long time to get um, my book in print. Uh, because I'm very transparent, I'm very open and real about the choices that I made. I'm not a person that uh, was formerly incarcerated that says I didn't do anything wrong or I didn't know um, what the guy was doing because I, ultimately I was in a relationship with a drug dealer. Um, and hopefully this book would help save lives, help young girls um, not get in crazy relationships and think that you know being with a drug dealer is cool when in fact it isn't. Um, and it shows what some of the consequences uh, can be. So I'm very grateful um, to finally have the story in print. And uh, because I previously, and this is, I don't know um, if you can see it, but um, ultimately it was uh, a writer, a journalist, um, Reginald Stewart, and he wrote uh, an article in Emerge Magazine. And George Curry was the publisher of this magazine. It was Black America's News Magazine. And I was so grateful that they decided that they would take on my story. But basically, by them doing that is what launched a movement where people became involved after I was sentenced to 24 and a half years in mm -hmm. federal prison as a first-time nonviolent offender. And the relationship that I was in with the drug dealer was abusive. Um, with my legal case, the prosecutor said I never handled, used, or sold any of the drugs that were involved, but yet and still, I was still sentenced to 24 and a half years. So by Emerge Magazine taking on that article, it launched the NAACP Legal Defense Fund, taking on my case pro bono, and several organizations jumping on board, such as the Deltas, the Lynx, the National Council of Negro Women. And... Um, it wasn't about people feeling sorry for poor little Kimba or feeling sorry for my parents because I was their only child mm -hmm. and because you know I was from this middle class background. It was because the fastest growing population within prison were black women. And so they had hoped that my case would set a precedent and help other people who are first time nonviolent drug offenders incarcerated. But um, unfortunately and fortunately for me, uh, my only source of relief was through receiving executive clemency from former President Bill Clinton. Did you ever get a chance to meet President Clinton? Um, I did, and it, it was uh, October of last year. Mm -hmm. um, it was a, uh, a campaign uh, where uh, Governor McAuliffe was running uh, for governor, and so um, Bill Clinton... Governor of Virginia? Yes. Bill Clinton was at one of his campaign stops and um, I had I was there and 
that was the first time I actually met him. So I never thought I could be starstruck or be speechless in front of anybody. Mm -hmm. But other than me saying thank you, I don't even remember anything else from it. It but. happens. <laughs> it happens. President Clinton is a very gregarious guy. Uh, we do promote literacy here on What's Up Kansas City. So we do recognize that this is a pretty thick book, but it's important that we do support Miss Kimba Smith, the poster child. Uh, it was easy falling in love with the drug dealer. The hard part was paying for his crimes. Now, this is not nonfiction. I mean, this is not fiction. This is the real stuff, nonfiction. You guys know the deal. Um, you're also an excellent motivational speaker. I heard you, I had the chance to hear you speak earlier today. You said this is your third time being in Kansas City. Uh, we don't want to hold you. I have four questions that I do want okay. to ask you. I know you have to get out and uh, eat your barbecue. <laughs> of course. Wouldn't be here and not get any. Barbecue with some fries. Okay. Uh, that's how it's, we're, you're supposed to do it when you're in Kansas City. That's how it's supposed to be done. Okay. Now I'm going to read my questions to you if you don't mind. Uh, I just prepared them this morning. Okay. Uh, Ms. Smith, I often hear parents say that they aren't sending their son or daughter to such and such a black college because it's a party school and they'll get into too much trouble. What can you say to young teenagers? Well, first off, I hope parents don't have that mentality um, because what goes on at HBCUs goes on at other universities too. Even though I was a student at Hampton University, um, what happened to me at Hampton University could have happened to me at Columbia University. Mm -hmm. I mean, I've read about big drugs, drug busts that they've had at Columbia University. And um, as far as what I would say to teenagers, regardless of where you're going to school, is that you have to stay focused. And oftentimes, for me, when back in the day, when I was you know, getting ready to go off to school, I was all excited. I was going to have this newfound independence. My parents not asking me a million and one questions. And when I finally got there, I kind of ran with it. And one of the things that I do talk to young people about, in particular young girls, is the issue of having low self-esteem. So, you know, I was in this new campus environment and, you know, felt insecure about myself. So there are definitely some things that you have to recognize about yourself, parents, some things that you need to recognize about your children that maybe you should have some discussions before they go off to college. But... As far as to the teenagers, just most importantly, the importance of you loving yourself. And if you love yourself the way that you should, you will be cautious of who it is that you keep around you. You will also be focused on your passion, your goals, what it is you want to do in life. And you will create a balance in that environment to realize I don't want to jeopardize my goal, my passion, the reason, the priority why I'm here at this institution. So I just you know, encourage the teenagers to stay focused and the importance of loving themselves. We know that social media devices can be used to bully Ms. Smith, but we know that they can be used to kickstart and for praise. Unfortunately, the bullying modus of operation can have devastating effects. Speak about how parents can be vigilant. Hmm. Um, for myself, uh, when my son, my son's a sophomore now. And I use Miss Smith. I should say Miss, is it Prada? It's um, Miss, Mrs. Pradia. Pradia. Miss Smith is fine too. Either way, I, um, you know, answer to both. So you have a grown son now? I have a grown son. A son uh, by the drug dealer that I was in a relationship with. When I turned myself into the authorities, I was seven months pregnant with him. And um, my parents raised him until I got out of prison. But um, I'm grateful for my son and I's relationship. But when he got into the teenage years um, and in high school, I did monitor, you know, his social media accounts. And um, I just think that it's important for parents to know what's going on with their child. I mean, I don't understand how some parents where their kid could be like, Mom, I'm blocking you and they just be OK with it because. I want to know who my child really is. And for those children that are doing the bullying, if their parents were monitoring their accounts, they would know that their child is being a bully. So I think it's just important that there be in, you know, full parental involvement during those formative years. But I know that it, you know, it can be difficult. And then there are a lot of kids that just don't have that guidance, don't have that mother and father for whatever reason. That could be no fault of their own, you know, so there's no monitoring of that situation. But again, you know, I think if 
when we're talking about the teens and the bullying and the ones that are doing the bullying, if they love themselves enough, they wouldn't be doing that type of activity. Mm -hmm. Obviously, if they're bullying, there's some issues that they have with themselves where they have to build themselves up by bringing other people down. And how can you block something when you didn't buy it? I mean, if your parent, most of the times the parents are the ones investing in social media. And I don't know, I just take, I'm listening to what you say. I would be credulous, you know, if, if my son came, our daughter came to me and said, I'm blocking something that you bought. You know, I, I would also want to be a part of my, my son and daughter's life. Exactly. While you were locked up, your parents were your spokesperson, crusading for justice for their daughter. Uh, President Clinton pardoned you. Part of what attracted advocates to your case is what they say are disproportionate and apathetic mandatory minimum sentencing. That would have been a tough one to memorize. <laughs> we have had Judge Garrett and we will be having Judge Otto on the same um, program coming up in upcoming months. Speak about the injustice that exists in the judicial system in our middle class and upper class communities. Wow, you have some thought provoking questions. Thank you so very much. Um, I will say my parents, um, they are the heroes to this whole poster child Kimba Smith story. Um, never in a million years would, I'm sure my dad would have never thought that he would have been walking away from his CFO position at an organization because his boss told him he, she didn't want him publicly speaking out about my situation because it was presenting a poor image to the company. So he made a conscious decision that he was going to walk away from all that and do whatever he needed to do to bring his baby girl home. Um, but the injustices that's going on, and I think what happened to me, not only educated my parents about my, their own situation, but when they came into the prisons to come visit me, they saw the many other people that are impacted by some of these unjust laws. and so. The, the laws that I speak on mostly are the disproportionate impact as it relates to crack versus powder cocaine, which President Obama did, uh, did sign the Fair Sist Sentencing Act that reduced the 100 to 1 ratio where a person would get sentenced 100 times more harsher for crack cocaine versus a person that had pure powder cocaine. Mm -hmm where they reduced that from 100 to 1 to 18 to 1. Um, but there's still a fight because, number one, it needs to be retroactive, mm -hmm. and number two, um, it should still be one-to-one. -one. Mm -hmm. And so um, those type of injustices are things that we've been continuously fighting. Um, also, too, uh, as it relates to um, my individual journey, is the fact that I know two women who are still incarcerated who have served over 20 years in federal prison who are first-time nonviolent drug offenders never been in trouble before who have a life sentence and so even though I share certain aspects of my story I'm trying to educate the community and knowing that my story is not unique and that there are other people that are still there that deserve the same opportunities that I've been given. So that's one of the reasons why I'm passionate about advocating for those that are left behind in prison and trying to change the laws. Passionate advocate. Uh, Ms. Smith, your book details your on and off again relationship with your ex-boyfriend, Peter Hall, who's now deceased. What do you tell your son to make sure that he uses the positive traits, if there were any that you saw in Peter, in his interpersonal communication skills slash connections? Um... My son, you know, ever since he was little, uh, I think from being around older people and being around my parents, he's always um, been intelligent and well-spoken. And um, I was concerned for Armani because I didn't want him to feel any less of a young man growing up, thinking that his father was a monster or because I'm in prison. And so... Um, eventually Armani accepted the person that I am today and he knew about the fact of who his father was and that I was with him and everything and some of the poor choices but he as he grew up he understood what I was doing today as far as helping other people in regards to his father I always told him about how intelligent his father was 
um, how he liked to watch Jeopardy. So my son took into watching Jeopardy. So, you know, we're always trying to battle, you know, watching the show. But, I mean, he knew that his father was intelligent. And I think he's taken those attributes and realized that he didn't want to go down the same path of his father, that he wanted to make sure he optimized every opportunity he could with his education. And so he stuck to that, even though I wasn't a parent that had you know, a huge saving son, go wherever you want to go to college. He knew that he was going to have to put some footwork in, looking up scholarships and everything. And so um, he's actually um, at Washington and Lee University on a guaranteed four-year full ride. And um, Congratulations. Just, thank you. Celebration time. Yes. Ooh. And, you know, I'm so, um, so very proud of him. But I think it's really important for, you know, mothers – you know, that's struggling with their children. And I know some of the time you may get frustrated in particular single mothers and, you know, the dads that may not be involved or either the dad that may be incarcerated. You know, you want to make sure in raising your kids or just a simple mom that's raising her kids and her husband's not acting right or divorced, you want to make sure that your kids know positive attributes of from both of their parental figures because they need to know those things so they can feed off of it and grow off of it and move positively. You don't just want to say how no good your daddy is and he lies and he cheats and this is that because a young man may want to take that on. You know, if that's all my father is and that's all I am. We have to try to find personal attributes where Peter, yeah, he had a bad side the guy that I was in a relationship with who was a drug dealer, I mean, he abused me. But I made sure that I tried to pull out some positive attributes so my son wouldn't feel any less of a man because of it. Well, thank you. I do relate to that story. Um, and we hope that all of our viewers will relate to your book here. Again, it is Poster Child, uh, the Kimba Smith story. Do you have any closing words for us? Just I'm so grateful to have this third opportunity to be back in Kansas City. And I thank you for what you do because... If it were not for the reporters, journalists, um, writers, you know, that highlighted this social injustice story, I could very well still be in prison. So thank you for your commitment. No doubt. How can our viewers contact you? Um, KimbaSmith.com, K-E-M-B-A-S-M-I-T-H.com, or you can go to KimbaSmithFoundation.org, or you can hit me up on Facebook. Awesome. We thank you for sharing your Sunday with us. Yes. I'm Glenn Bryan Frizzell with What's Up Kansas City. We are certainly pleased with our viewers who tuned in. Reach for the sky, aim high. If you shoot for the moon and you miss, at the very least, you would have landed among the stars. Thank you.